This is a review of exponential and log functions. We have a test coming up. This is part one of the review. This is only half of a review, so watch out for part two. If you have a pencil in your hand, please put it down. Watch the video, see how I do it, and then pick up your pencil and go back and see if you can do it by yourself. Look, if you cannot remember how to do the problem uh, five minutes later, that means you don't really know how to do the problem. So, and that's something you need to know. Okay, number one. You deposit $11,000 in an account that earns 8.9% annual interest. Find the balance after seven years if the interest is compounded with the given frequency. Huh, compound interest problems. I didn't know this stuff was gonna be on the test. Yes, it is. Are they gonna give us the formulas at least? No they are not. You need to know the formula. So compound interest, continuously, semi-annually. Um, what, what were those formulas again? Let's take a look. Um, now in general compound interest, if you're talking about some uh, unit of time where they're compounding like uh, semi-annually, quarterly, monthly, daily, um, this is the formula that you would use. So, let's look back again. For part B, when we do semi-annually, this would be the formula to use. But uh, continuously has its own formula. Do you remember what it is? We called it the PERT formula because if you look at it just right, it sort of spells the word PERT, um, which is an actual word if you look it up. Um, anyway, Continuously. If you see that it's compounded continuously, this is the formula we are going to use. This P is the initial amount. E is a constant. It's on your calculator. It's approximately 2.72. Um, R is the rate in the decimal form, and T is the time. So let's check it out. PERT. Okay, obviously Y is the amount we'll have after some years go by. Okay, so if we're using the PERT formula, let me just write it down. Uh, no, not P equals. Okay, so the eventual amount will equal the initial amount times E to the RT power. Now, you deposit $11,000. That is the initial amount. So that means the amount we'll have years later should be 11000 um, times E. Now the rate uh, is going to come from this. Um, to get the rate we need to move the decimal two times to the left. So this will be 0 0.089. That's R. So here we go. 0 0.089 and then times T. Well, find the balance after seven years. So T is seven. Some kids think, oh, they said annual interest, so that should be a one. Um, it's always annual. When they talk about these percent, they, they always give the percent as an annual interest rate. Um, but you have to look elsewhere to find out how many years um, we are saving. So seven years, so it's seven, not one. Anyway, um, this is relatively straightforward because I should be able to just put all this in my calculator and get the answer. All right, so let's see, 11,000. Um, let's see, where is that E? All right, E is above here, so second LN gives me my E, and it's already ready for a, a decimal, so 0 0.089 times 7. Kabam! So, our $11,000 will become $20,509.65. Okay, so that is the answer for part A. 
Now for part B, it says semi-annually. So um, this uh, is giving us the n value that shows up in this formula. Semi-annually means twice a year, so that means n is equal to two in this formula, not that formula. Yeah, this is the general compound interest for everything except for continuously. And this n, if it's uh, annually, I could just let n be one. Um, but if it's semi-annually, it's two. If it's quarterly, it's four. Um, if it's monthly, it's 12. If it's daily, it is 365. All right, it's all about what the n value is. So in this case, n is two. So here we go. The amount we're gonna have is going to equal the initial amount. All right, this p is the initial amount. You know, maybe I'll just write this formula here. Y equals one plus the rate over n to the nt power. All right, this is the formula that we're doing. So we'll need our 11,000 again, just like before, okay, because that's our initial amount. All right, and this time we do one plus the rate. The rate is still this 0.089. Um, but this time we will divide that by 2 because that's the n in the formula and in the exponent we will do 2 times 7 alright the same n and the 7 for time is the 7 years so again I should be able to put this in my calculadora and see what is what okay so here I go 11,000 times 1 plus fraction mode 0 0.089 over 2. Close parentheses to the power of 2 times 7. Okay, so this is giving me $20,235 Um, and if it's money, always give me the penny. So that's 36 cents. All right. So as you can see, you get a little bit more money if you compound continuously rather than semi-annually. Okay, so that's problem number one. Problem number two, write a logarithmic function that has been reflected over the x-axis compare with the parent function and has a vertical asymptote of x equals negative 3. Um, well look guys the parent function uh, would be like this. Um, you know we could just write log um, x. Okay that's the parent function. So um, now reflected over the x-axis Hopefully you know that a negative sign in the front is what reflects things over the x-axis. So um, if it's going to be reflected, then that's going to be a negative in the front. Okay, so, so far I've got this. Alright, so this is the parent function reflected over the x-axis. Now um, it needs to have a vertical asymptote at x equals negative 3. Now you know that the vertical asymptote is usually uh, the y-axis. Okay, so if it's over at negative uh, 3, that means it has been shifted over to the left 3. Okay, so what does it take to make a graph shift over to the left 3? Alright, now I'll give you some choices. Is it inside the parentheses? Is this where the left-right motion happens? Or is it outside the parentheses? Uh, hopefully you remembered that left-right motion is caused by changes inside the parentheses. And this is the one that's the opposite of what you would normally think. So if I put a plus 3 in here, that will actually shift us to the left 3. 
and give us a asymptote of negative 3. Um, so this is it right here. All right, reflected over the x-axis, done. Vertical asymptote of x equals negative 3, done. Let's put a box around it. Okay, and I'm just going to erase this because I'm done with that. All right, similarly, uh, number three, write a logarithmic function that has been shifted up six and vertically compressed by a factor of one third. Okay, again, starting from the old uh, parent function of log x, if I want it shifted up six units, then I'm just going to add six on the end. Um, don't worry if you're thinking, well, wait a minute, I thought that would be a shift uh, left 6. Well, that would only be if it were in parentheses, okay, because then it's inside. If there are not any parentheses showing, it's understood to just be, you know, just x. So this plus 6 is hanging on the end. That's your up-down motion, and uh, so that is indeed up 6. Now, vertically compressed by a factor of 1 -third, uh, that's what happens when you multiply by one third. So there you go. If they had said vertically stretched by a factor of three, I would have put a three here instead of a one third. Okay, so that's number three. Okay, number five, what's going on here? Graph each function using a table of values. Um, two graphs should be shown, the parent function and the final function. Okay, so basically we're going to graph this like we've done many times before. Um, when you're graphing a log function, we have learned to start with the y value. So we will start with our negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. Um, we have also learned to look at the parent function. So this is y equals log base one half of x. Now, if we re if we rewrote that in exponent form, it would look like this. Okay, starting with the uh, the base. Okay, so we'd have our one half. All right, brought that down. Now the x and the y change sides, so I'd have x equals one half to the y power. So this is what we're going to use to find all these x values right now. So that means I'm doing uh, I'm doing one half uh, to the negative two power. See, I'm doing one half to the y power, and these are all my y. So that's one half to the negative one power, and one half to the zero power, and one half to the one power, and one half to the two power. So that is going to give me, all right, let me look ahead a little bit. They're shifting and stuff. So these are going to be temporary values. So I'm going to use my green. Okay, so uh, if I do this, please remember that a negative power uh, gives you a reciprocal. So this will be like having two squared because I do the reciprocal and it's two and I make it positive. So that's why this is going to be four. Again, the reciprocal makes this a 2. Anything to the 0 power is 1. 1 half to the 1 power just stays 1 half. If I do 1 half squared, that is 1 fourth. Okay, so these are my x values. And I got my y values. Um, let's see, is there an a value that we need to multiply by? Yes, there is, all right? We have a 3 here. So um, that means we need to... Um, we need to multiply everything times 3 to get the third column. So I'm going to do everything here times 3 because of this 3 right here. So times 3, so that's going to give me negative 6 and uh, negative 3 and 0 and 3 and 6. So these are my new y values. So I can forget about the old y values. I'm just going to put a line through that. Now, the one thing I still haven't done, um, you know, I did the 3, but I haven't done this plus 4, um, which shifts everything up 4. Um, so 
that's why I'm doing this in green. So I'm going to graph these points so far, uh, but I'm just only going to put the dots and I will not connect them because they are not the final answer. So here we go, 4, comma, negative 6. Okay, so 4, negative 6 would be right here. And then 2, negative 3, 1, 0, 1 half 3. Okay, so over 1 half and up 3. And then 1 fourth and 6, so over just a little bit and up 6. So we've got these nice points right here. Okay, so this is what I mean by dots only. Okay, so there's our first graph, uh, temporary. Um, now we do any shifting that we're going to do. And uh, that'll be plus 4. So everything is going to move up 4 because of this. Again, if it were in parentheses, it would be a left 4, but it's not. So this will be my final answer, so I will do this in blue. So if I take this and I shift it up 4, it's going to be right here. Okay, and this one is going to be right here. Um, wait, that should have been right in the middle. Okay, so that one's going to be here. Um, up four is here and here. Is there one more? Yeah. Two, four. Okay, so I took the uh, green points and I shifted them all up four. Now this is my final answer. Notice that shifting these up, shifting the, uh, the graph up does not change the vertical asymptote. So that's still going to be the y-axis. All right, all that's left is to connect these dots as best we can. So I'll start up here at the asymptote and just try to connect these dots as smoothly as I can. All right, make sure your graph goes all the way to the edges of the grid. All right, looking at number six, we're gonna do that same thing. Um, so temporarily ignore the, uh, the shifting, okay? So our parent function here is y equals log base 3 of x. Uh, again, if we rewrite this in exponent form, starting with the base, which is 3, and then the x and the y switch places, switch sides of the equation anyway. Um, so this will be 3 to the y power x equals 3 to the y power. And then we will use this to get all of our x's. Um, so again, we will start with the uh, y values of negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. So to find the x values, they should equal 3 to the y power. So that means I'm going to be doing 3 to the negative 2 power and 3 to the negative 1 power, and 3 to the 0 power, and 3 to the 1 power, and 3 to the second power, all my y's. Okay, so that is going to give us, um, well that negative 2 drops you down, so this will be 1 over 9, and 1 over 3, and 1, and 3, and 9. Okay, um, is there an A value this time? No, there's no A value. There's nothing in the front. So that means we can just forget about the third column and just deal with these. So let's go ahead and just graph these points. Now, I'm going to graph these in green to remind myself that these are temporary. Um, we will still have to do the shifting with the plus 2 and the minus 1 to get the final answer. Okay, so 1 ninth and negative 2. One ninth is so small that it's going to really appear to be on the line. So one ninth and negative two is going to just look like that. One third and negative one. So that's over a little bit and down one. One comma zero, of course, is right there. And then three comma one and nine comma two. All right, so these are the five points. We will not connect them, dots only. Now let's do the shifting to get our final answer. 
Okay, and remember the uh, the plus two here is going to be a shift. What do you what do you think? What's this going to do? This is going to move us left two. What's this minus one going to do? That's going to be down one. So left two and down one. Okay, so every point's going to have to do that. So left two down one okay left two down one okay left two down one okay so the blue dots are the actual final answer don't forget about your asymptote now this time, because of that shift to the left two, the asymptote is gonna be over here at negative two. All right, be careful to ignore the green dots because they were just temporary and focus your eyes on the blue dots, okay? Now, we want our graph to go all the way to the edge of the grid. Obviously, um, the rest of this curve is gonna be so close to the asymptote that it's gonna appear to trace it. So, as I start to draw, um, this part of the graph is just going to appear to trace the asymptote. Okay, nothing I can do about that. Um, until it gets to here, and then it starts to curve its way off of the asymptote. Now in your mind, of course, you know that it doesn't really touch. But we can never avoid the appearance of touching. Okay. So your graph should look very much like that. Please make sure your graph um, is drawn all the way to the edge of the grid. So that's the final answer for number six. All right, number seven says fill in the following information for the function in problem number five. Well, this is problem number five right here. The domain is how far a function goes from left to right, the x values. This function stops at the asymptote, never reaches it. So the domain is going to go from the asymptote over to the right. So in this case, the domain is 0 to infinity, all right, from the asymptote over. The range of a function is uh, the y value, so it's how far it goes from bottom top. Now this graph goes down forever and it goes up forever. So the range is negative infinity to positive infinity in that order. Um, the asymptote, of course, is this vertical asymptote, which was x equals zero. Don't just put zero, you have to put x equals zero. And of course, uh, now this graph is, uh, as we go to the right, um, this graph is going down, down, down. Um, so this is decreasing. All right, and that is it for number seven. Now, number eight. For these problems, we are supposed to find the inverse of each function. We've got to show our work here, guys. Um, now, finding the inverse basically involves two steps. Step number one, you switch x and y. And step number two, you solve for y. Now, please keep in mind that um, in order to solve for y, we will usually have to change back and forth between log form and exponent form. So just as a quick example, say if I have something in log form. Say if I have y equals, um, let's say, log base p of x. Okay, that's log form. In exponent form, if I was going to make this switch, I would start with this base. Okay, so I'd bring that down. Now the x and the y will change sides of the equation. So the x is going to come over here, and the y is going to become the exponent. 
Now notice log form has a log in it, L-O-G. Uh, exponent form does not have any kind of log in it. Not a L-O-G, not a L-N, nothing. Instead it has an exponent, all right, a base and a power. So if you're starting off in log form, you can bet you're going to end up in exponent form. So please do not let me see L-O-G in your final answer for number 8, 10, or 11. Similarly for number 9, this is exponent form. So you can bet your final answer is going to be in log form. So I want to see that L-O-G. All right, anyway, let's do it. OK, so first of all, this f of x is very much just like having a y. So our first step is to switch x and y. So this will become x equals log base 9 of y minus 6. Now our next job is to solve for y. I've got to get y by itself. Now, since uh, I have the log expression by itself already, I can go ahead and uh, rewrite this in exponent form. So in exponent form, um, you start with the base, and then uh, everything else is going to switch sides, all right? Meaning these two things are going to switch sides of the equation. All right, so that's why I'm going to have my y at minus 6 over here, and my x is going to come over here and become the power. Okay, notice no LOG. This is exponent form. So we're trying to solve for y. So all I have to do now is add 6 to both sides, and I'm really going to be done. Instead of y, though, I'm going to go back to um, the function that we had in the first place. Okay, it was f of x. So we will write for our final answer f inverse, with a little minus 1, always a minus 1, equals 9 to the x power plus 6. So this would be the inverse function for number 8. Number 9. Now this is an exponent function. All right, now this g of x is just like a y. So our first step is to switch x and y. So this will become x equals 4 times 7 to the y power plus 6. Now our job is to get y by itself. Before we can write this in log form though, the, the base and power here has to be by itself. So this part of the equation has to be all alone. So first get rid of the plus 6 by doing minus 6 on both sides. So that will give me x minus 6 equals 4 times 7 to the y power. Um, still got to get rid of that 4. So next we divide both sides by 4. Okay, that leaves me uh, with the base and power by itself. So now I will have x minus 6 over 4 equals 7 to the y power. Now that I have the base and power by itself like I wanted, now it's time to rewrite this in exponent form, which I will do over here. I'm sorry, I said exponent form. Now it's time to rewrite this in log form. It already is in exponent form. So log form, again we start with the base. Um, but obviously in log form, it'll be log base instead of just base. So the base is 7. So I'm going to write log base 7. Put the L-O-G on the line, but let the 7 be low. OK, let it hang low. Um, now, so with that in mind, so I've got the 7 taken care of. Now this and this, everything else in the equation changes sides. OK, so the y is going to come over here, and the x minus 6 over 4 is going to come to the right. So notice how that gets y by itself by bringing it over to the left side of the, of the equation. And the x minus 6 over 4 is going to jump over here 
and be a uh, part of this log expression. So this is the final answer, except for we will go ahead and put back um, our original function. So they, they, they're saying g of x. Um, so we'll put the g back in there. But because it's the inverse, we will write g inverse with a little negative 1 on it. All right, that is number 9. All right, number 10. Please remember that natural log is the same thing as having a log base e. All right, that's that's what it is. We're going to need that in a minute. All right, natural log just means log base e. Um, okay, so in fact, um, basically what we have here is y equals, and I'm going to go ahead and write it out in a way that we normally would not just to make a point. So y equals log base e of x plus 8 minus 4. But you know what? I'm going to do this right now. The, um, our first step is to switch x and y. So I'm just going to do that right here. So that's going to give me x equals log base e of y plus 8 minus 4. Now our job is to get y by itself, solve for y. We cannot rewrite this in exponent form right now because we have this minus 4. Okay, the log expression, which is this, has to be by itself before you rewrite the problem in exponent form. So clearly, I must add 4 to both sides to get this log expression by itself. So that's going to give me x plus 4 is equal to log base e of y plus 8. Normally we would never write log base e. We would just write natural log ln. Um, but I need you to see this e so you can see what I'm doing with it. So I wrote it out. Now that the log expression is by itself, now I will rewrite it in exponent form. Uh, starting with the base, which is e. That's why I wrote it this way. So I start with that base of e. Okay. Now, everything else except for this log e is going to change sides of the equation. So this uh, y plus 8 and the x plus 4, these need to change sides. Okay, in exponent form. So I will have y plus 8. Now this is going to change sides, but it will become the exponent. This is exponential form. So I'll have my x plus 4 up here. So y is almost by itself. All I need to do is subtract 8 on both sides. Cancel that out. So this is going to give me the final answer, what you see right here. Now this was h of x, so I will go ahead and write h inverse of x is equal to e to the x plus 4 power minus 8. All right, and that would be the answer to number 10. Okay, so once again, this is very much like having y equals log x plus 5. Um, the base though, I need to know what this invisible base is. Alright, I know by now you all have learned that this is invisible base 10. If they don't tell you what the base is, like they do usually, um, it's a base 10. So, first step is to switch x and y. So that is going to give us x equals, and I'm just going to go ahead and keep writing log base 10 of y. Uh, plus 5. Now I'm going to want to rewrite this in exponent form but again you cannot do it until the log expression is by itself. So this plus 5 over here I'm gonna have to get rid of that so minus 5 on both sides. So that's gonna give me x minus 5 is equal to log base 10 of y. Now that the log part is by itself like I wanted, I can rewrite this 
in exponent form. Starting with the base. Uh, so the base is 10. So I will write 10. Okay, now everything else except for the log and the 10, uh, everything else switches sides of the equation. Alright, so the x minus 5 is going to come over there and the y is going to come over here. Alright, that's why this is so useful because it will get the y out of this log expression by itself. Okay, now this x minus 5 is going to be the exponent. This is exponent form. So it has to go up high like that. So, uh, yeah, this is the final answer. Um, but we will just simply put the uh, function notation back in there. This was p of x. So when we write our final answer, we will put p inverse to show that this is the inverse of the original function. So p inverse equals 10 to the x minus 5 power. Genius. All right, for number 12, we are supposed to graph this function and its inverse on the same coordinate plane. And they only gave us one table. So we should be able to do this all on one table. Let's start with doing the part that we already know, um, graphing the log function itself. All right, I think we already did one of these before, so it should be pretty easy. We start with the y values, like we always do, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. Now, as far as the x values, well, uh, we focus our eyes on the parent function, which is y equals uh, log base 2 of x. That's the parent function here ignoring the minus and the minus one and the plus two. Uh, but we already have the y value, so this form is not useful to us. We want the x value. So to get the x values, we need to rewrite this in exponent form. And in exponent form, we would start with the base, like we always do. Base! And the y and the x will switch sides. So I'll have x equals two to the y power, which of course means I'm going to be doing um, 2 to the y power. These are my y's, so I'm going to be doing 2 to the negative 2 power, and 2 to the negative 1, and 2 to the 0, and 2 to the 1, and 2 to the 2. All right, please remember that a negative power drops you down to the bottom. So this is going to wind up being one-fourth, and this will be one-half, and one, and two, and four. Now, do we have an a value? Well, yes, we do. This negative sign is just like having a negative one. So that means to get the third column here, we're going to multiply everything by negative one. So if I do that, that's basically going to change the signs in all of these. So this is going to be a 2, a 1, a 0, a negative 1, and a negative 2. You can probably see why uh, putting a negative in front causes everything to uh, reflect over the x-axis. See how everything just turned upside down? Well, anyway, now that we have this third column, this middle column of y values, we better cross that out. Now, we will not do anything with the minus 1 and the plus 2 yet. What we will do is we will go ahead and graph these points that we have. Um, and I'm going to graph them in green because these are uh, temporary uh, points, and I'm not going to connect them. All right, well, I've got 1 fourth and 2. So that's over. Um, just a little bit and up two, so that'll be right about there. Then one half comma one, so that's over half of a unit and up one. And then one comma zero would be right there, and two comma negative one would be right there, and four comma negative two would be right there. 
Okay, so those are my temporary points. They're not the final answer. I've not done the shifting yet. I'm going to have to do that now. So do not connect these dots. Now as far as the shifting goes, okay, um, and you know what, I'm going to make a tiny little table here. All right, so the original, okay, and then later we're going to talk about the inverse. Okay, so the original graph, um, this minus one, what is it going to do? It is going to take us to the right by one. What is this plus two going to do? That's going to take us up two. Okay, so it's right one and up two. Okay, now as far as the asymptote, let's get that out of the way. Um, moving up and down doesn't do anything to the to a vertical asymptote. Only the moving right one part will. So that means um, I'm going to have a vertical asymptote right one. All right, so there's my vertical asymptote. So now I need to move move each one of these five points right one and up two. So here I go. So right one and up two would be right here. Okay, and then uh, so if I move this right one and up two, and wait, there's one right here. So right one and up two, right one up two, and right one up two. So these will be the actual five points of the final function. Now we've done everything. So all we have to do is draw the graph as best we can. Um, we can see that as we move toward the left, we're going to be approaching this asymptote. So um, on this end, it's going to be so close, it's going to appear to trace on the asymptote. So uh, always start from the edge of your graph, but go ahead and for this part of the graph, it's just going to look like it's tracing. Okay, so your graph should look very much like this. Please make sure your graph goes all the way to the edge. Now, this is the original graph. Now it's time to graph the inverse. Here's how you do it. First of all, um, start by graphing uh, the inverse of all of the temporary points, the little five uh, temporary points that we did. And uh, the easiest way to graph the inverse of the temporary points is just to reverse them, all right? The inverse of a single point is um, what you get when you reverse the x and the y. Now, so this 1 fourth comma 2, the inverse of that would be 2 comma 1 fourth, all right? Now, I don't want to put all this in the way of the graph, so I'm hoping you can do this mentally, okay? Um, but so 2 comma 1 fourth, all right, as we switch these backwards, would be like here. It would be over 2 and up just a little bit, like right here. Now this one, um, switching these around, instead of 1 half comma 1, it would be 1 comma 1 half. Okay, so that would be over 1 and up a half. So it would be right there. This one would be 0 comma 1. I might have to move these later. Um, 0 comma 1 if I switch them around. So 0 comma 1 would be right there. And this would be negative 1 comma 2. So negative 1 comma 2. And finally, this one would be negative 2, comma, 4. Switching these around. So negative 2, comma, 4. Okay, so these orange dots are the inverses of the green dots. So the orange dots are the temporary 
um, dots f uh, pertaining to the inverse function. Now we just have to shift them. All right, now, so you just have to understand how to do an inverse shift. Maybe I should change the colors for this too. Uh, all right, I'm gonna do this in red. Uh, I'm gonna do my inverse in red. Now, as far as the shifting that we're gonna do, um, guess what, it's still gonna be the same numbers, the one and the two. That part doesn't change, so we're gonna have our one and our two. Now here's what changes, the right and the up, okay? Now, um, think about it. Right and up, you know, like this is right over here. That, that's a positive value, okay? I'll put an R for that's right. And this is up, correct? And this is also a positive value. Um, down here, I'll put a D for down. That's a negative value, all right? Our negative values are down. And over here is left. And that is also a negative value. Now, when you go from the original to the inverse, as far as the shifting goes, the number part stays the same, but here's the key. Um, the, uh, the two positive terms switch, and the two negative terms switch. So what I'm saying is, um, if uh, anywhere you see up, an up shift is going to become a shift to the right. A left shift is going to become a shift down. Um, and it works backwards. If you see something that says right, it's going to become up. And if you see something that says down, a downward shift is going to become a shift to the left once you're talking about the inverse. So it will help you remember, if you think of it this way, um, positive switches to the other positive term. And the negative term switches to the other negative term. If you think of it that way, it will help you remember. Okay, so right. What is right going to switch to? Right is going to switch to up, all right, the other positive term. Okay, so the original, we shifted right one, but the inverse, we will shift up one. All right, what is this going to sh shift to? All right, instead of up, it's going to be right. All right, both of these happen to be positive terms, so they both are going to um, switch to the other positive term. Okay, so the inverse, we're going to have to shift up one, and write two. So we're going to take each one of these orange points and move them up one, write two. Okay, so up one, write two would be right here. Up one, write two. Okay, up one, write two. Up one, write two. And up one, right two. All right, so these red dots are the real deal. This, they show us what the final graph is gonna be doing. Now, um, the asymptote, let's not forget the asymptote. Um, the inverse of a log function is an exponential function. And uh, exponential functions have horizontal asymptotes instead of vertical. So don't think there's going to be a vertical asymptote over here. That's not what's happening. Um, it's going to be a horizontal asymptote when you do the inverse. Now, as far as where the asymptote is, it's going to be the same number as the vertical asymptote, just horizontal. So we had a vertical asymptote at 1, positive 1. We will have a horizontal asymptote at positive 1 for the inverse. Now, all we have to do is connect these dots and uh, show how they approach the asymptote. Um, so please make sure you're focusing on the red dots. See, we've got a whole lot of, we've got green dots and, and blue dots and um, orange dots and red dots. But the, um, the red dots represent the final uh, inverse here. So focus on them. So, okay, we're going to have to start off um, from this edge and just 
it's going to appear to trace the asymptote at first till it begins to branch out like this and just keep it going just curving around as best you can okay so that is pretty good so your final answer should look very much like this um, as a side note please understand that uh, the original function and its inverse will always be reflections of each other over this diagonal line uh, called y equals x okay this is the line y equals x now notice if you sort of tilt your head sideways or slanted and look at this diagonal line you'll notice that um, the double image here is split right down the the middle this is a mirror okay and it's because this blue tail over here is the mirror image of the red tail alright and this red curve over here if you look at it is the mirror image of the blue with the uh, diagonal line as the reflecting line so that's just uh, gives you a mental check um, if you do a graph and a diagonal line doesn't split your double image right down the middle you'll know that you did something wrong. All right, but um, that was just for educational purposes. Do not draw, don't draw the diagonal line. It's not part of your answer. That's it, that's your answer. Um, of course, we are supposed to go ahead and discuss these uh, pieces of information, the end behavior of the original and the end behavior of the inverse and so on. So end behavior, let's do it. okay um, the original graph is here in blue so for the end behavior we will have to say as X approaches right this is the part where we look for what happens as we go to the left but first thing we notice is as we go to the left the blue approaches this asymptote doesn't go past it so we used to say it approaches infinity or well negative infinity but this doesn't it x approaches the asymptote which is at 1 so as x approaches 1 so uh, the question is what happens to the y values so as the x values are approaching 1 the y values go up 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 so the function approaches infinity okay so basically as we go to the left approaching 1 the y values approach infinity so next we have to say what happens as we go to the right so okay that means as the x values approach infinity alright because it does go to the right forever and now we say what happens to the y values as as we do that so as we go to the right the y values go down 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 so the function approaches negative infinity so that's your end behavior for the original graph um, now let's switch over to red since the uh, inverse graph is in red and see what happens okay um, we still have to start with talking about what happens on the left so as x approaches now looking at the red forget the blue um, the red does go to the left forever so as X approaches negative infinity so the question is what happens to the Y values so as we go to the left the Y values go up 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 so F of X approaches infinity now down here we say what happens as we go to the right so as X approaches positive infinity uh, what happens to those y values now okay so looking at the red so as we go to the right the y values do they just go down 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 no the y values get closer and closer to the asymptote which is one okay so f of x approaches one alright now it might be helpful to compare the end behavior of the original 
and the end behavior of the inverse. Now if you look at it, um, you'll see how everything is just sort of backwards, okay? Um, the right hand end behavior is the same as the left hand end behavior of the inverse. And then the, uh, the left hand end behavior, um, oh yeah, and it's, it was backwards. So as, it, um, as we approach infinity, the y values approach negative infinity. Now here the x values approach negative infinity, the y values approach infinity. So these are uh, reversed in every way possible. Like everything is backwards. Okay? So just um, you can see how everything is turned inside out for the inverse. Um, now as far as the x-intercept, for the original function, all right, this one has a nice clean x-intercept at um, 5 comma 0. Um, if it's between the lines, you will just have to estimate. But this is at 5 comma 0. Uh, now the y-intercept for the red one, all right, the inverse, guess what? 0 comma 5. All right, see how they're just, uh, the x's and y's are just reversed. Um, as far as the asymptote, the original function had a vertical asymptote, which is x equals 1. All right, meanwhile, the uh, inverse had this horizontal asymptote, which would be y equals 1. Now, looking at the blue, the domain, that's how far it goes left to right. So the domain is asymptote on over. So that's 1 to infinity. Use a round parenthesis to show that the function does not include the asymptote. Never never get there. All right. In the meantime, the domain of the inverse is going to be negative infinity to positive infinity because of the way it goes left and right forever. Now the range the original graph, all right, the range is bottom to top. So this blue, looking at the blue function, the original, it went from negative infinity to positive infinity. It goes down forever and up forever. Okay, now the range of the uh, inverse function, okay, now we have to switch and look at the red. All right, range is bottom to top. This doesn't go down forever. It starts off near the asymptote. So it goes from one up. So bottom to top, the range is one to infinity. All right, and the order matters. It has to be in this order. So once again, notice how these are related. Okay, the domain and range just switch places. Okay, so that will help help you sort of check your work. All right, if your domain and your range are not the same for the uh, for the inverse and the original, you did something wrong. All right, let's move on to number thirteen. All right, I think this is the last problem on this worksheet, which is good because this is getting to be an hour long video. And it's only part one of the review. What am I going to do? All right. Well, I'm just going to suck it up. That's what I'm going to do. All right. So number 13. You need $35,000 in 12 years. How much you, should you invest now at 11.5% annual interest compounded continuously round to the nearest penny? Okay. Well, first of all, you think about which uh, formula you're going to use. And I see the word continuously. That really jumps out at me. Um, will I use this one? Uh, no. This one is not for continuously. This is for quarterly, semi-annually, monthly, daily. All right. This is the formula that we use for continuously, the PERT formula. Okay, so that's half the battle is knowing which formula to use. Okay, so with that in mind, and let me just recopy it. 
So we're going to do this. All right, so we're doing, using the PERT formula. Whoops. Got to make sure that RT is an exponent. That's better. Now, please understand the difference between the Y and the P. Okay, the P um, is the principal. It is the original amount. Okay. Okay, it is the amount that we have now. The Y um, is going to be the eventual amount. Okay, it's the amount that we're going to have years later. So I'm pointing this out to you because uh, you have to be conscious. Um, a lot of uh, students, when you see this big number, you just automatically assume that it's going to be uh, the principal, all right? Because that's how it is on many problems. But that's not always the case. Sometimes this 35,000, this big number they're giving us, turns out to be the eventual amount that we're going to have years later. So uh, you can't just start plugging things in. You have to actually read the question and think and decide. Is this the original amount or is this the amount we're going to have years later? So let's read the question again. If you need $35,000 in 12 years, whoa, okay, in 12 years from now. So that makes this the eventual amount. Okay, that makes this the y value, the amount that we're going to have years later in 12 years. Okay, so um, the original amount, well, let's see, how much should you invest now? Okay, well, that's our p is how much we should invest now. We don't know what it is. That's what we're looking for. So um, that's why when we set up this formula, the 35,000 goes in the front of the equation, all right? Because that's the eventual amount years later. Um, P, we will just leave it as P because that's what we're looking for. It is unknown. E is just a constant. It's not a variable. It's approximately 2.72. So we will definitely leave that as E. Um, now, R is the rate. Okay, I got 11.5%. Um, that translates into an R value of 0 0.115. Please understand that to change this to a decimal, you have to move the decimal point twice. So 0.115%. Okay, so fine, 0 0.115. And then the time, well, in 12 years. So 12 years later, that means I need a 12 here. Now, be very careful how you execute this. You are not allowed to round anything until the very, very last step. So do not put just this part in your calculator and then divide, in, because you'd have to round, and that's going to mess everything up, up. So instead, what you want to do is, what you must do is, go ahead and divide both sides, because we're trying to get this P by itself, yes? Um, but because we can't round yet, we need to divide by e to the 0 0.115 times 12. Just divide by all of it. e on both sides. e to the 0 0.115 times 12. All right, that way these cancel each other out. And that will just leave us p, which is what we wanted. Okay, so we can just put this in our calculator. Check it out. Okay, it's really blocking my screen. Can I do any better than that? All right, that worked. So I'm just going to type all of this in my calculator. So, you know, fraction mode. So 35,000. All right, divided by 
Now I need that e, so I do second natural log to get the e. 0 0.115 times 12. Okay, just type it in just the way it looks. Kabam! All right, so $8,805.25. Didn't leave myself enough room for the cents. Okay, now just add, take a step back and ask yourself, does it make sense in general? Okay, so if I need $35,000 in 12 years, I'm saying that I need about $8,800 now. So if I invest this much now, it'll grow and grow and grow, and in 12 years, it'll be worth this. So that makes sense. So this is the answer number 13. All right, please make sure you can do every single problem on this uh, review sheet by yourself. All right, if you had to watch the video to do it, that means you need more practice. Make sure you can still do it tomorrow and the next day. Um, please remember this is only part one of the review. Watch for part two. Um, if you want a complete review, you have to be able to do every problem on both part one and part two of the review. Then you'll be ready. You'll be ready. I will see you on the next video.